Pendo, you were over in Lima at the CCAF seminar on food and nutrition security, and you just finished with the sessions. There were six issues presented that the organizers had found particularly pressing for farmers. Which of the six would you say is the most pressing one? All of them were important, and I was in the gender equality issue uh, theme, but I also liked the discussion about nutrition, food and nutrition, and uh, mitigation, and how mitigation should not uh, impact negatively on food production and nutrition, and some of the issues that were raised there. And why do you like nutrition? Why do you think it's important? To hear all these discussions about um, nutrition versus uh, feeding, as it were, you know, food, when you're hungry, you want to eat. You're not going to think, oh, I'm going to eat vitamins and minerals, and this is not what you're thinking. You just want food to satisfy you. Mm -hmm. And at, this, at some level, at the global level, we're talking about two distinct forms, nutrition, food security. At the local level, well, people just want to eat. Obviously, there are issues related to what type of food. And some of the proposals that are coming from, let's say, the, from common, um, or from the discussions at different fora is, you know, focusing on certain foods, like I heard orange, potatoes, etc., foods which are supposedly local. But then, you know, at the same time, in many of these countries, in the developing countries, West Africa or wherever you are, you find that when you go to the shop, what you find is not necessarily those traditional foods that have been recommended. You find white rice imported. Mm -hmm. You find certain foods which are convenient and they're available, but those so-called nutritious foods which normally that's what you want people to eat, are hardly there. So how are we taking these messages that we would like, or we're talking about at a higher level, translating them into a reality at the lower level? Because wealthy, affluent people always have something to eat. They can decide they're drinking uh, highly sweet drinks and a lot of high um, or dense caloric foods which are not necessarily healthy, but that's a choice. That's affluence. But at the lower level, what choices do the people have? Let me delve into that a little bit. I find that maybe a little bit too simple. We have a very similar discussion in the first world where you actually have uh, people talking about biodynamic food and others say that's only a middle class discussion. Uh, those foods are not available for the poorer people. And then on the other hand, you have uh, a scenario like in Myanmar where people produce very nutritious rice and the Chinese dealers arrive and uh, trade it off for the same price for their cheap white rice. And so you would have to educate those farmers to actually know about nutritious value uh, in the food. Agreed. But my question then would be, if I'm selling to you my nutritious rice, is it because I'm uneducated or because I see that in order for me to be affluent, I need to eat white rice. So again, I'll ha if I am trying to develop this whole development discourse, we're looking at it from a supra level. But if you are in a situation whereby you are somewhere down here and you're thinking or developing, what are you thinking about? Being like the guys on TV. Being affluent mm -hmm. means driving a car, mm -hmm. eating a hamburger, drinking uh, Coca-Cola. I mean, that's affluence or some ideas of affluence within certain communities. So I will sell you my brown rice because that's not cool to eat. I'll eat white rice. Now, how are you going to make me realize that, you know what, I can have the brown rice and still be affluent and still afford to have some white rice? and I should not sell it all to you. How then do you, is it really a question of education or is it a question of changing mentalities? In certain countries, in, for example, Southern Africa, I saw this in Tanzania, they have started these campaigns to say, eat local foods. Our local leaves, you know, in many of these societies, people ate green leaves, it's not spinach. I mean, spinach is just something one of the many. You've got leaves from um, beans, from peas, from a cassava plant, from so many other plants, which we forgot about most of the times. The minute we go to cities, we don't, or we hardly do. It's still there, you can still find it, but it's not as easy to find. In certain countries, they're promoting using radio in local languages, mm -hmm. you know, emphasizing that, look, it's nice to drink or to eat uh, a hamburger or to drink a highly caloric drink. But you can still do that, but maintain a healthy diet. And how can you afford this healthy food? Because 
going back to your argument about uh, organic foods, for example, in, in, in developed countries, they are expensive indeed. But anyway, we'll go to that later. So how can you, um, how can you maintain this lifestyle and still be having nutritious foods? Because you know diabetes is taking hold, diseases of affluence, they're going into many of these societies, overweight, uh, heart disease. All of these are diseases of affluence in general. I mean, they were not in such large quantities in the developing countries. So one way indeed, sensitize the population using all sorts of means that the foods that were available there, they're adaptable to the climate and they're good for you. You can eat them and do mm -hmm. eat them, please. And these are foods which you cannot store in most of the times. In the traditional societies, people go to the market every day. You buy fresh produce every day. So the concept of buying in bulk and storing is not, is not the same. Now, maybe I said it a bit the wrong way when I was speaking about education. I didn't mean it to be formal education. I was thinking more of uh, getting the right kind of knowledge uh, to people to make uh, good decisions for themselves. So probably pretty much what you were talking about when you spoke about sensitization. But let me ask you, are we maybe entering an unequal competition here with the large corporations? They have all the the resources available to them. And on the other hand, you have the guys with the good course. How can you win that? I mean, imagine a radio or TV show where the host invites an expert and they speak in front of the desk about some good food. And then afterwards comes a commercial where all the beautiful people with their lifestyle sit there and eat burgers and, and, and enjoying their life, even though they probably don't eat too many of those. Otherwise, they wouldn't be looking like that. But they have the marketing power. And what are the measures that you can think of that could actually counterbalance this maybe a little bit? They have lots of money. They have budgets for this. They have millions and millions of euros, dollars, whatever you want, dedicated to this. Now, how can we counter this? One way we could try is, well, obviously, if if you're going to fight fire with fire, then you need to also come up with good images. Mm -hmm. You know, let's stop this boring type of advertising. Come up with also good images. Try, you won't have as much money, obviously. Unless, of course, you can priori countries can prioritize it and have, you know, put uh, resources to actually doing this. You know, saying, you know, we would like to promote healthier society. In general, it's not really about nutrition. About, so, and again, when you talk about healthier societies, it would start from farming. Like somebody said today, from farming to the fork. So how then do you encourage those farmers who are producing this type of, of foods to carry on producing this type of foods? Again, it's going to take sensitization and saying, yes, I know you're planting. These are mostly home gardens or, you know, this type of small agriculture. It's not large-scale agriculture. Again, it's small, uh, small scale. So you'd have to uh, start from those farmers, starting to sensitize them. And then, I mean, first of all, a priority at the national level, or regional level, or whatever local level, put resources where your interests are. Because without resources, you can't do much. Mm -hmm. Put resources there, and then start campaigns, some kind of national campaigns at different levels. Use, um, use language, well, local language, I would say, but also language that can reach the people you're targeting. McDonald's and all of them with beautiful ads are targeting a people who are aspiring to be. Mm -hmm. So if I'm aspiring to be, that's what I'd like to be, obviously I'm going to look at McDonald's. They're going to touch me. Now how do you or me try to reach people who they have aspiring to be versus what? You need to be healthy? So I think the whole message of health, it, it has to be more holistic. It's just not about nutrition. It's more holistic about your health. Why is it important to protect your health? That's one way. I'm sure there are other ways. But you know what? You could actually run quite decent advertisement campaigns by separating the beautiful people on your side of the equation and the not so fortunate looking ones on the uh, fast food side. And that would be highly credible uh, to, to, to go that way. You could speak to the insurance companies in the third world con uh, countries, the health insurance uh, companies, and to speak to them about not just printing glossy brochures, but to enter into using people like George Clooney um, to run proper campaigns. Uh, probably a good idea, George Clooney, not to just speak about coffee, but more healthy foods as well. And then there is uh, voter campaigning in the first world. Uh, in the US, um, 
the farm bill, um, highly subsidized sugar production, people are voting these governments into power. And maybe one could uh, do a little bit more on uh, getting into gear with these uh, on, on that angle. The problem is if I'm a farmer and I'm having sugar being subsidized and I'm growing sugar producing crops, I'll be in a disadvantaged position if I support you. And I hope you'll understand that as a farmer, because I'm after profit. Uh, but having said that, if we look at the issue of subsidy, I mean, then we're looking at mostly developed countries. I think in the developing countries, the issue of farm subsidy is not necessarily the main issue. Well, in some countries, there is subsidy, maybe to large-scale farm in terms of hydro, um, water, irrigation, and, and maybe at some level fertilizer. I'm sure in these large-scale commercial crops, yes, you would have some sort of subsidy. But, I mean, these are commercial crops, and then we go into another issue. I'm going to divert here slightly. We're into another issue. We're planting commercial crops, and these are the ones that are marketed. You know, we've got sugar, we've got coffee, cashew nuts, etc., cotton. None of these things are edible. So many countries have spent a lot of money uh, promoting all of these cash crops, which are for sale. This is market, and they go on the global market. And who's determining the prices? Not the farmers. Mm. In fact, the buyer determines the price. You know, if you look at uh, what many large corporations put into your food, you would not call that edible. So we go back to our natural foods, to our, yeah. Yeah, to our so-called traditional foods, but these are our natural foods. And I agree with you that I would absolutely vouch for a program or for prioritizing those foods that are nutritious, that are available locally. Obviously, in today's mm. world, mm. we want to eat avocados year-round. We want to eat uh, mangoes year-round. We want to eat all these exotic fruits and veggies wherever we are in the world year-round. That means importing. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that. We can argue from a climate uh, footprint point of view, yes, there are issues there. We can argue from uh, labor issues, there are issues there. Mm -hmm. But w notwithstanding all of that, we can still promote local foods. These are some things which are more perishable and, you know, they go quite quickly. And then the other question would be, how do we preserve this, you know, to keep them slightly longer so we can add some value to these farmers or, you know. so. I think the discussion, if we go back to the beginning of the question where we started, we could start from the farming, from you know, where we're farming or who the farmers that we're trying to target. This would be our farmers who are farming these traditional foods. And how do we encourage them to continue farming these or traditional or highly nutritious foods, the foods that mainly we've forgotten to eat? And then we go on to how do we promote the marketing and the uptake of these products? This is where our beautiful campaigns that would come in uh, to promote this. And we'll still have McDonald's doing theirs, but obviously, like we, we spoke about, if we can have a comparable and we can have data to support what's healthy and what's not. And then the third issue would be to have a more holistic approach. You know, we're not just talking about nutrition. We can't break it down to nutrients only or just to food. Uh, food security is a good point, yes. We can keep these words at a high level, but as long as we're talking to People, we need to use a language that's understandable. Why must I eat all of this? Why? I mean, because you need to be healthy. Let me put it to you that way. You might have a third or fourth generation of people living off fast food. You have a knowledge gap. These people don't know how to prepare nutritious food and also to how to make it tasteful because that's obviously also important. Now, what you're going to do about it? Sensitization and language will not crack it. You will have to go out and show these people again how to cook nutritious, tasteful food. Two things, not only show them how to cook the stuff, but also, uh, like you said, these people have been living off fast food. Why have they? Because fast food is accessible, one, and two, it's cheaper. In certain countries, obviously not everywhere. In developing countries, in most cases, it's still expensive. So you still have, you know, it's not so favored. But in developed countries, it's in certain countries, we don't have to name names, it's cheaper. So you would walk into a fast food store and buy something for one, two, three, whatever currency it is, and you have a complete meal, so to speak. Empty, but complete. But why is it cheaper? Because you have cross subsidies. This is an issue even at the EU level, mm. subsidized foods. And because they're subsidized, they're 
they're mm. flooding the market. And at the expense of the farmers who are not subs the subsistence farmer, the African farmer, the poor farmer in developing countries, they're not subsidized in most cases. So they have to compete with this, and that's why they're outcompeted. So I agree with you. Then we deal with the issue of subsidies. Then we're talking at a much higher level. And these discussions are ongoing. But as we're waiting for the issue of subsidies to be dealt with, we should not stop dealing with it. We should address it. That level, we carry on that conversation, agreed. At the national level and at regional levels, we come up with, you know what, health. The problem is we speak in silos. I'm dealing with climate change. I'm dealing with agriculture. I'm dealing with nutrition. I'm dealing with food security. So why can't we just talk together? <laughs> At the end of the day, what do we want? We want healthier people. We want agriculture that's more, uh, that has got more value added to it. We want our farmers to produce crops which are good for us, and we want the farmers to have good income. We want to have market uh, for our products. But do we really have to go to the world market all the time? Can't we have regional markets? Can't we have national markets? Can't we encourage this type of uh, markets? Of course, they do exist in most countries, they do. So the message could be, let's have real competition, because real competition is good for nutrition. Like in the case of the collapsing Soviet Union, where the fatty meat products came off the shelves quite soon. Well, and the other one is about the G7. Um, they don't seem to have a problem to just talk about growth and jobs, don't they? No, they don't. So that's why we need different messages for different levels and for different people. You know, at like we keep on saying, yeah, Ma competition is good, agreed. But I think before we come to competition, we need to address a number of issues. The issue of subsidies. Because if we don't deal with that, we, we can't talk about competition. There is no competition. There is no, in fact, there is no exchange at all. I'm selling to you full stop. And you're buying, you're determining the price. So who, are we, who am I competing with? There is no competition. So we have to deal with the issue of subsidy. And then we also, on the other hand, have to have enabling situations, I don't like the word though, and they, <laughs> you know, to create conditions that would allow the farmers in those countries that we're trying to promote to actually be able to grow and to have those markets because I'm not going to grow some orange potatoes because you think they're good for you or me for that matter. If I cannot sell, I'm a farmer. I live from this job. I need to make money at the end of the day. So I'll sell cotton if that's the only thing that's going to feed my children. So if you want me to start growing this foods, which probably I stopped growing since they're not profitable. Remember, I'm buying my own fertilizer. I'm buying my own uh, seeds. So why should I change? You know, I need to know that whatever it is I'm going to produce, I'll also have a market for it. It's useful, one, and two, I can sell it or transform it. We talk about value chain in all of this discussion. And for all of these things, we need lots of trashes to come in. So. Indeed, we have a lot of work to do, and much of it is happening, but in different places, in different stages, in different silos. So at some point, we still need to have this holistic approach and to have uh, action at different levels, at the high level on the subsidy issue, looking at the markets, world markets, but then again looking inside at the food situation, because how did uh, the Asian tigers grow? They looked at the first fed themselves and then they will start developing at some point. If you're hungry, you can't talk about development. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>